WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. And good afternoon. This is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mikes. I'm Dr. Michael Crone. And uh, I'm Dr. Mike Hargan. I'm not quite coast to coast, but uh, I am just getting back from a trip out to uh, Minnesota. So uh, it's good to be back. Minnesota. So where are you now? Uh, we're just kind of pulling up the last leg, but we ended up, we were in Dayton, and we were in Stillwater, Minnesota which is a really nice, it's an old, like, lumberjack town just across the border from Wisconsin. And then we ended up back in Chicago because I had one grandson who was getting uh, baptized, and one grandson uh, had a first birthday, and I found out that I'm about to have our first granddaughter in a few months. So, it's uh, you know, life is, life is great. So you went to to Minnesota Stillwater Minnesota you went to Chicago you went to Dayton and now you're going home yeah yeah just about pulling in so uh it's been a pretty good trip and you know kind of quick but we got to check in and uh when you have family and kids who are married and they all tend to move away once you go to college and they move away sometimes it's hard to get them to come back home so uh so we have to check you're trying to get them, get them to come back home well no i i think they should be where they where they're comfortable, wherever they put their roots down, you know they they, they each they each found a, a good spouse, and uh, and you know they're doing a good they're doing their deal. That's good. Yeah, you reminded me a little bit of the opposite of fair. You're the launch there, where you're like, oh well, you know, it's hard to get them to come back home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so just to start out with it with. Um, to to uh, answer the question from last week when I'd lost the Internet and couldn't answer you, we were talking about in Colorado where um, they don't have a fetal homicide law so that even if, you know, the mother is is not happy with the fact that the child, if the child dies due to violence and the mother is not happy but the mother but the child is still in the womb, in Colorado you can't charge someone with murder. Um, you remember that from last week? Yeah, that's amazing. I don't see how I don't see how that how they couldn't charge him with murder. I mean, it's uh, you know talking about pro-choice. If you take this woman who's carrying the child uh, choice away from her by killing the baby, that's horrendous. That's that's even more violent than murdering somebody out of you know, out of a disagreement and passion. So, uh, so they can't get the bill passed. I I have not seen anything that suggests that they they're getting the bill passed. They had not had one before, and um, recently, uh, last month, uh, a woman had a who was seven months pregnant had her child cut out from her. And uh, I didn't know this last week, so I may have accidentally used the wrong pronoun. I haven't checked myself on the uh, on the replay, but the. The assailant was another woman. She has been charged with first-degree attempted murder, which I'm guessing, although it didn't say explicitly, when I found this, I found this on Nine News, which is one of the local TV stations in Denver, Colorado. Um, I'm guessing, it didn't say in the article, but I'm guessing it's for the mother, not for the child. Yes. Unlawful termination of pregnancy in the first degree. It doesn't say what the penalty is for that, but I'm guessing that's nowhere near what it, you know, should be for the circumstances. And then first and second degree assault, as well as some other lesser charges that weren't named. These were the highlighted of the nine charges that that nine years pulled out. Um, So there are things that they are able to um, charge them with, but you're not going to get nearly the same jail time out of that that you would get if you were able to say, well, look, here is a child that died. There was some talk that they might be charged with murder, but in order to get that in Colorado, you would have to prove 
that the baby breathed outside. The baby basically was alive outside of the womb. And they say they, they wouldn't be able to get that proven in court. Um, and so they, they were not able in this case to charge with murder. That's unfortunate. Yeah, and I mean, it really shows how things related to abortion can get caught up in politics because there's really, I doubt that there are a lot of people who are pro-choice or, you know, favor abortion rights or whatever, you know, we want to call them, who actually would prefer that someone who goes through this kind of behavior doesn't get, you know, a murder charge or some sort of charge equivalent to murder. I think it's actually mostly that they just feel that they can't give an inch for fear that, you know, then they will be seen as backing down in some way. What do you think on that? Well, yeah. I, I, do, are you, do you know how many states actually have laws that protect the unborn from the point, you know, from the point of, of being uh, violently assaulted to the point that they die? I guess there are some states that you you will be charged with murder. Yeah, actually, it's 30-some. I don't have the number right in front of me, but in 30-some states, since I've been looking into it, I remember the number that came up. Um, In 30-some, so that leaves, like, I think it might be 10 to 15 states where you that are like Colorado where you cannot be charged. But most states have, and they call them fetal homicide laws, where fetal homicide. if it's not at the mother's will, but due to a violent act, the child dies, then you can charge someone with fetal homicide. So most states actually have this. Um, what, what I still find most um, impressive, if you will, is that the, the you know, abortion rights side seems to be mostly resisting getting this done in the remaining states. Yeah. Well, you know, if if they protect the fetus from an you know unwanted assault, then that really kind of sheds poor light on the fact that you can pay a, a physician to you know to, to suck the kid's brains out or, or to or to dismember them, and then so it's I mean I can understand where where they wouldn't be crazy about it, but uh, some of the rhetoric as far as you know protecting the woman's choice and all that that kind of like smacks in the face of that. Yeah, I mean, it really does. It's, it's. I mean, I think the whole thing is really caught up in politics, unfortunately. Um, and well, politics. Well, you know, when you start killing babies, it really does. It really does get to be pretty messy. So I'm sure they have a hard time, you know, dotting their eyes and crossing their T's. So. Did I lose you? No, no, you got me. Oh, okay. I'm afraid now that I hear that you're moving. But you said I've got um they have a hard time crossing their eyes and dotting their keys, so um so it's just yeah, difficult it, you know. if you will. Yeah. To, uh, yeah, and I and I agree with that. In fact there's there's a there's a post, there's there's a group and I don't think there are many people who are pro life in the group, but there's a group called um Less Wrong. And they are um, I know them. I'm not necessarily endorsing them. In fact, I'm probably not endorsing them. But it's a group of people trying to be, like, super rationalist and logical in terms of all their conclusions and stuff, you know, all their arguments and all that. And I think it's it's a good exercise, but I think it, it mostly just gives them the illusion of thinking that they are. But I bring them up just because in this discussion I'm reminded of one of their posts, which um, – I I thought it was pretty good when I saw it. And it's called, uh, the basic point of it is once you have one lie, then the truth is forever your enemy. Like, let's say, I mean, today, just to to give a story, you know, I I went out to, to a public library to have a quiet place to do some research on the Internet. And then I walked to a grocery store um, to get lunch. And then I, um, Continued there on the internet doing um, doing work, and then then I went back to uh, where I've been staying for for a little bit before I get traveling some more in Laurel, um, Laurel, Maryland. By the way, just in case anyone's curious, um, 
And I tell this story just to say, what if on um, um, one point of it I wanted to, to lie about something? Like, let's say just for some reason I, I never wanted to admit to having been to a grocery store. I don't know why. Maybe I didn't want to, like, didn't want to get blamed for not picking up milk or something while I was there. So I'm like, oh, I didn't go to a grocery store. Well, that might seem like a fairly easy lie, um, you know, and how much harm is done, you know. I just, you know, got myself out of carrying something heavy about a mile to get it back where I was because I was going on foot. Um, but the truth is, once I lie on that, all kinds of other details can possibly come up. Like someone will say, oh, you know, did you see such and such? And I'll be like, oh, yeah, they were at the library. And maybe they weren't, maybe they were. And now all kinds of information suddenly becomes my enemy. In fact, you know, once I tell one lie, I have to do, you're going to have a whole series of lies to back that up. And now... To, to give them their due, most people who are abortion rights don't think that they're telling a lie by saying that the, the fetus, you know, isn't a person. But at the same time, I think most of those same people would prefer a fairly serious charge against, you know, a woman who wanted to carry a child to term and through violence against the both of them ends up with the child dying. And I think it's an equivalent thing. Once you once you start, um, once you take something and you try and hide from it, or you try and um, you know go away from. In this case, it just seems to me like it would be the sort of the standard moral intuition for convenience. Then, in this case, you know something entirely different becomes your enemy. What do you say to that? Well. Yeah, I, I I can see how that would be. In fact, uh, that's a very moral kind of a, uh, you know statement. And uh, I when I was out in Chicago, I met a man who was a police officer, and he said that he's been working on a more constitutional law enforcement. And I said, Wow, that's great. What do you mean constitutional law enforcement? And he said, What he's been doing is trying to understand his uh, you know the people that are in the neighborhood where he's working, so that he can understand their needs and what security issues they have. And when it comes down to something, then we'll do what's practical. I said, oh, you mean you're going to do what's constitutional? And he looked at me like, well, maybe not. I'm just going to do what, what seems to work, you know. I'm saying, well, then how is that more constitutional? And in his mind, it is. I mean, it's more him talking to them and trying to do the right thing for them may be more constitutional in his mind than, you know, tyranny and, you know, knocking doors in. But at the same time, He's really not interested in constitutional. He just wants to make nice with some of the people that he has to enforce the law with. So uh, it's the same kind of thing. Once you once you accept a distorted you know version of what words mean, then you get caught up in 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 trying to make it all fit. Yeah. So so I'm not sure I followed that. We only have another uh, about a minute and a half. But are you saying that he they claim it's constitutional law enforcement? But what that means to them is just whatever is nicer to the public. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes, yes. It's the same thing where you have more and more people claiming to be pro-life. And when you really stop and talk to them about, you know, strict life, are you going to are you gonna kill this one kid in the womb because it was conceived out of rape? You know, nothing to do with the rape, but this is going to kill it, but you still say you're pro-life. Well, you know, the definition doesn't always doesn't fit. So people... People get a, a kind of watered down version of what they of what they think, and that's what they accept. But then, when you talk to them about it, it's really not. So when they get into a conversation and they find themselves not really in into what they claim to be, then I think they're caught. Whether it's a lie, direct lie, or whether it's just you know using words that have meanings that really don't don't fit. Yeah, I can see what you're talking about that. I think after the break, we should pick up a little bit more on the people who call themselves pro-life. And yet they say, oh, well, you know, I." some of the people who call themselves pro-life truly, if questioned, aren't, um, aren't in favor of many of the lies. We'll be back. This is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. And 
Good afternoon. This is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. So I'm Dr. Mike Crone. And Dr. Mike Argon, back from our little break here. And before we left, uh, we were we were talking about the definition of pro-life and how many people, uh, you know, latch on to it depending on the conversation or on, on where who they're with and how and how they feel at that time. So, Mike, you said you were just going to kind of go into that a little bit. Well, I just wanted to say, I, I generally think that, and this is a little bit surprising to a lot of pro-life people when I say this, um, people who are seriously pro-life, not just call themselves, is that people who call themselves pro-life and aren't really pro-life when you start to question them or want to back out of it when you want to question them, it's really a good thing that they're choosing to call themselves pro-life. Once again, we can get into, you know, all the talking I do about the mushy middle. What you're seeing there is somebody who really, in most cases, doesn't even really think about it that much. Sometimes it's someone who has an actual middle position that they're very strongly for. But in most cases, what you see is someone who doesn't have a very strong position and that those people choose the label pro-life is a sign that the pro-life label is more attractive to them than the pro-choice one. And so what I'm saying in that is, you know, for most of the mushy middle, what you're going to see and what's going to be a good thing and what's going to lead to, you know, the end of abortion is people just feeling better about the pro-life folks than they do about the pro-choice folks. So, I mean, if I were to send it back to you, I mean, what have you seen um, recently or in the past that would suggest, you know, like that the pro-life versus pro-choice, you know, how people are thinking about it? I didn't phrase that well. well as a question. Let me put it. You got it? Yeah. yeah, well, I know I know people who, if they're speaking, uh, say, say to myself and some like-minded people like myself, they like to identify – as being pro-life, they understand it and they and they you know, they sympathize with it. But these same people, if they're also in a group that's like feeling threatened that a woman's not going to be able to get an abortion if she thinks that her her life is not in not in danger, but if it's going to negatively affect her health, you know she's going to be a little stressed. Then then they'll tend to sympathize that way. So your mushy middle has to do uh, oftentimes with where a person the audience that the person is in a discussion with. So if, if the definition of pro-life was, was, was nailed down to the point that, you know, it, it meant defending human life in all its forms, then, you know, really no matter what, unless, unless it's pure, pure uh, self-defense, then, then you'd find many people who think they're pro-life in one crowd would not be, and probably a little bit vice versa. So... So, so what you're saying actually is that are you talking about like political people, like politicians, or are you just talking about ordinary folks when you're t when you're giving this ordinary example? folks? Yeah, ordinary folks who still have the gumption to talk about life issues. Most ordinary folks that I've that I've met avoid it. You, you, if you bring up uh, you know life issues, you know at a, at a mixed gathering, you know or you know cocktails or whatever you want to call it, you know you're not going to get much of a discussion. But uh, most people are uncomfortable with it. So, but those are the kind of people I'm talking about. They're not not a political candidate or something. I'm talking about people in just in conversation that you would that you would meet day in day out. Right, right. Um, and I think you're you're kind of always going to get some some of that. But what you get when you have, you know, an an election, for example, is a forced mostly binary choice meaning and you're you're forced to choose between candidate A and candidate B and I know both of both of us have experience in third parties but for almost all practical purposes what most ordinary voters see is a choice between you know A or B and what's important is which they pick at that time 
And that's where I say the fact that they've chosen to call themselves pro-life, and I guess, you know, when they call it to me or you, that's not necessarily a good example, but when they call it in a poll where, you know, it's fairly neutral, they're just given a couple of terms, which are in both cases the term that the proponents of the, the view prefer, and they, they pick, as they have done over the past about six years now, pick pro-life a little bit more than pro-choice. Well, that's a sign that, that we should expect more. And to be honest, I think we are getting a little more. We're not necessarily getting as much more as we should, but I'm going back to an article from 10 days ago that came out in the U.S. News. Now, if at least if Laura Chapin, who has written on uh, – life issues, as I would call it, and women's rights, as she would call it, is to be taken as as a uh, bellwether, if you will, for, for the magazine, or mostly I get it off the website now. They are not in favor of abortion rights, but they have pointed out or claimed or argued, I don't know if they're saying this is happening in the past or will happen in the future, but they say Republicans seek to put abortion on the front burner in 2016. So this is exactly what I have been hoping that the Republicans will do. It's saying that Republicans are going to put the focus on the abortion issue. As polls and research has shown, abortion is typically – a winning issue for Republicans, so there really isn't much of a reason why they wouldn't. It's possible that, I mean, I can think of sort of secondary reasons why you wouldn't do that in that case, but I think it makes a lot of sense. And U.S. News is saying that Republicans are are um, going to put um, abortion on the, the front burner. He, they quote... Um, Lindsey Graham, who is one of the presidential hopefuls, and by the way, um, one of the presidential hopefuls who I have contact information for on drmichaelcrone.com, um, I, I still suggest to everyone contact at least one of the candidates about once a week, just a very short note to, to remind them to think about the unborn, to talk about what's been going on, just take a couple minutes and do that. Um, set a reminder for yourself every uh Every week is what I recommend if you have a, a phone calendar or any similar thing. Um, I actually just recently sent a message, but if I get into that, I'll be getting off topic from this um, to a different candidate. But uh, Lindsey Graham says, quote, I am dying to have this debate talking about what, what U.S. News calls the controversial abortion bill the federal ban on abortions after 20 weeks. Um, and Lindsey Graham says he's dying to have the debate. Now, he said that um, during the primary stage, and he hasn't even announced, but it's presuming he announces. Will he say that, can we get someone who has put enough emphasis on the cam campaign trail so that we can be pretty sure that they will continue to have that emphasis during the main campaign. What do you think on that, Mike? Well, you mentioned Lindsey, Lindsey Graham, and as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't believe a word the man says. I mean, he 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 is about as far from the Constitution as as any other of those uh, you know stuffed shirts down there in in uh, Washington. But his his defiance of personal liberty is just it's it's like monumental and for him for him to be associated closely with a real pro life movement is i think more of a detriment than a positive uh he he's a he's a mouthpiece for israel in many in many ways and he just he's just not real he's not true he's a neocon so any any time you talk about real issues that have to do with U.S. personal liberty and our and our nation, he's oftentimes way out on the right, and he and he has he has an, an agenda that just reeks of being anything but 
for the United States of America and for the U.S. citizen. So, so if he so, says he's pro-life, I, I would say he's only pro-life to the point that he's using the pro-life voters to try to get some credentials to try to bump him up some and, and make him seem as if he's something he's not, which is just, just that he's going to run this excuse for a, a politician. So, so you, you basically imply in your argument that there, that all the neocons are dishonest, or at least that's what I read into it. Because your argument for why he's dishonest is basically that he's a neocon. Is yes. isn't your claim that all the neocons are dishonest? In my mind, understanding the Constitution, understanding American liberty, understanding you know sovereignty. Yes, if, if they if they have that mentality. And they hear them speak, and they just they just talk around very basic principles that our country's been founded on. I mean, just listen to Ron Paul versus any of these jokers. Uh, it's yeah, it's pretty obvious. I wouldn't trust any neocon on any position that he claims to have, because if he if he sold out on constitutional you know ideology, then he'll sell out on anything. Well, I'm not sure no, that's. I mean, so so you're basically saying the Constitution is important when you say sold out. What you're suggesting, but what I see in a lot of the neocons are people who, you know, they who believe as you know, honestly, unfortunately, the majority of Americans really do if they think about it. Um, that you know, the Constitution is not intended to have the strict limits or no longer has the strict limits that are actually written into it. Um, and are you, you know, I, I do not find that you're making a compelling argument that the people who are, you know, not strict constitutionalists don't believe what they're saying. I mean, when you say sell out, you're saying like they somehow found that they could get more support by, by, being well, uh, no. neocon. To me, well, it, 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 the Constitution is the basis for our law. So if you do not respect the Constitution, then you pretty much have, have taken the train off the track. So it, it's, their, it's their game. So you need the Constitution. The Constitution was there to, to chain down government, to keep power contained. So if, if they're willing to ignore the Constitution... Well, then, in my mind, I'm not saying that, you know, that anybody else agrees, but I know a bunch of people who probably have a similar attitude, that I wouldn't trust those people with any form of government, especially government regulation or, or that kind of thing. Well, as, as the most optimistic pro-lifer I know, you know, I have to say, so I want to bring that up just to say, look, it's not like I'm just a pessimist about where the American people are. I don't see any similar signs that we're going to get anyone, whether it's Lindsey Graham or Hillary Clinton, other than the people who, you know, to use your words, don't respect the Constitution. Or to use their words, you know, believe, oh, I don't know, something like, well, what would they say? The Constitution is a living document or something like that? Right, right. right. So, it's, uh, yeah, but, you know, if you, if you came in, and you choose, you know, the best, of, you know, the, the worst of the evils or the best of the evils, well, then you, you're, why waste too much energy on that? Because are you really achieving anything? Are you really making any headway? So I would say you're not. I would say stick to your principles. Look for the people who at least you believe are honest and are, and are willing to make a stand, and you support them with what you have. All right, this is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. We'll be back in five minutes. Like that fake talk. Yeah, that's what I said. Real talk. <laughs> and that's exactly what I was talking about with uh, Lindsey Graham. I don't think it's real talk. I think he's shown he's shown a major flaw 
in his character when it comes to government. So anything he says to me is not real. It's not real talk. So what is, what is, what have you heard from him that makes you say that he's not being real, if you will, rather than just disagrees with us? Okay. I, I base a lot of my opinions on, we were very fortunate to have a congressman by the name of Congressman Ron Paul who put it on the line for us. And, he, and as far as I'm concerned, he was a gift from God. And, like, Lindsey Graham could do nothing but attack him. So anybody who's going to, is going to have that position, and when you hear his logic, you wonder, you know, what constitution is he talking about? Or, or where does he get his basis for his governmental, uh, you know, form? So I, uh, and there's many of them like that. And so I just, I just was so impressed with Dr. Ron Paul that the way other people treated him, the way, the way he was received, and then from there, looking at their different positions and all, it didn't take too much to see that they are very flawed in their concept of government, especially constitutional-based government. Well, that's, that's saying that he disagrees with us, which I, I accept. I mean, he's got the view that, that we can police the world, if you will. Let's just go with that view, which I disagree with, I think is, is tragic. But if he is going to agree with me on the idea that, um, and, and by the way, he has said nothing in this article to indicate that he's going to do anything to be so, so nice as to say end abortion in the near future. You know, he's basically talking about wanting the debate on the 20-week ban. Is he the candidate that's going to end abortion in the near future? No. I don't think so. I could be wrong. He could prove me wrong on this. Let's say he proves me wrong. He's still the guy that's going to be, you know, supporting Israel to make life difficult for its enemies in that region and make them our enemies. And that, you know, many people on both sides are going to pay for that. Well, according to our great number that Obama praised in the State of the Union, 21% of Americans die from abortion. Why would I say, okay, I, I, I think you're just absolutely wrong on what you're doing with America and what its constitutional role is, what its role in the world should be, what its role is as given by the Constitution. I say you're, you're wrong on this. But I do have to say, oh, well, you're going to actually end the thing that's killing 21% of Americans? Well, that's, you know, unless there's another candidate on the other side who says we're going to do that and we're going to, you know, have a better foreign policy, which, I mean, isn't going to happen unless, again, prove me wrong, but I think that one's a really strong prediction, then why wouldn't I not let the unborn be the hostage for a disagreement that, to be honest, we both have with a fairly large percentage of the American people. How can the the unborn, I've talked before about how the unborn are the casualties in the culture war. Because, you know, the people like you who are basically cultural conservatives and have certain views on, on how things should go, and the people mostly like me who don't um, who aren't pro-life, but who are on, on many other issues like me in terms of being um, socially liberal, can't get along well enough to, to make our um, views on a, I think I may have lost you. I'm getting beeps, but I think Mike, Mike Hargadon will call back in and I'll be able to um, paraphrase this. But I, what I see here, whether it's with, you know, sort of, the whether I want to call myself a small L libertarian, whether I want to call myself a capital L libertarian who's registered as a Republican for political convenience, um, whatever I want to call myself, for someone who thinks that it is truly tragic that that 
where you're causing so much trouble in the world by trying to be the world's policeman when most of the world doesn't want it or isn't interested in the sort of um, laws, if you will, that our police is trying to enforce. I'm not going to hold the unborn hostage for that, the same as I'm not going to hold the unborn hostage and make them casualties in the culture war. Um, Mike, do we have you back? Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike Hargadon, we have you back? Okay, we do not have Dr. Mike Hargadon. Um, we, but so I'll just um, explain what I mean to to people who haven't heard some of my earlier shows or on the previous shows when I talk about how the unborn are casualties in the culture war. Um, so what I mean by that is this this came up. Um, an earlier show that we had on this network when we were discussing how um, in past March for Life, and I have to say that there's been no sign of this recently, um, a group, a gay and lesbian pro-life group called the Pro-Life Alliance of Gays and Lesbians got kicked out of the March for Life. And basically, um, the uh, organizer of the March for Life didn't want them there. So from a legal issue, they had the permit, they can kick them out. Um, that's one thing. My point is that it was, and the phrase I used before was apocalyptically stupid, but it's that it's very stupid to kick them out. Because here are people that can reach out to a group that, I mean, to say the least, is not very sympathetic in general to the pro-life cause. And the only reason that the um, pro-life people weren't willing to allow them there is because they disagreed them, with them on a completely different issue, and I should point out a completely different issue that has not nearly the carnage that, you know, legalized abortion has. And so in that way, the pro-life side was allowing the um, – unborn, to be the casualties in this culture war. Generally, when you think of the culture war, I mean, you think of people disagreeing on pornography, on homosexuality, and all these things. But there's no actual, like, physical casualties unless you actually count the fact that the pro-life community will not, was, was reticent to accept, and I think they've done a lot better. I've marched with a lot of these non-traditional pro-lifers at the March for Life. And I think things have improved a lot, but they were letting um, the, their differences in the culture war prevent success for the unborn and allowing the unborn to be casualties of the culture war. Now, on the other side, people who are socially liberal like myself have frequently come to me and said, when you do this pro-life stuff, how can you um, get, how can you associate with these people? So rather than actually make an argument that you shouldn't have, you know, abortion in the United States, or that you should, I'm sorry, that they would make an argument that you should allow abortion in the United States, they just say, oh, well, the people who are making this um Point. I mean, they, they, they have all these things that you clearly don't agree with. Why are you associating with them? Well, there, and one, that's called an ad hominem attack. If you d try and defeat an argument by just going after the people making the argument, that's not a good logical argument. But secondly, they're doing the same thing. On both sides, we should avoid letting the unborn be casualties in the culture war. Now, the, the war within the Republican Party between the neocons and um, I might actually accept the word isolationist myself, but other people who just want to have a humble foreign policy. Again, is the sort of thing where we could let the unborn uh, be casualties. And let me check again. Hope against hope. Uh, Dr. Mike Harganon, are you back with us? I'll take that as a no. Um, and so I, I would like to get him back because, you know, I, I know he's on the other side of this, and I'd like to get him to respond. We still have another, you know, five minutes in this segment. 
But my point on this is that when we have, when, when we say, you know, I can't possibly support someone who, um, you know, is allies, well, to use this example with Israel, well, what are the odds if you actually look at American politics? I can see a likelihood and a serious change coming on abortion. And unfortunately, I see a lot more groundwork with the American people necessary to either get just return to a constitutional federal government, or even, not even that, but just saying, you know, we're not going to have Israel because it's clearly got some legitimate, uh, it's got some legitimate enemies, meaning people who have a reason to be upset about what they're doing. And I, I'm, it's not the first, because I mostly pay attention to domestic things, certainly in strong agreement that there is that problem with Israel. Um, I just don't see the United States saying that due to public opinion at this point that it's going to change that without more groundwork. So I don't see holding the unborn hostage until we get a resolution on that. Dr. Hargan, I'm guessing you're still not back. All right, we have a few more minutes. Let me go to um, more of, of this same article from the U.S. News talks about um, Senator Rand Paul and uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Now, we've talked about this on our show before, that Senator Rand Paul – um, and, and as most of our listeners are probably aware, was able to bounce back the questions, you know, the, the tough questions, if you will, on abortion about whether you were to support rape, cases of rape and interest, incest, onto the chairwoman of the Democratic, Democratic National Committee, uh, Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz, um, by basically saying, look, are you okay with killing a seven-pound baby? And she basically came back and said, yes. She's, the quote in U.S. News is, she, quote, supports a woman's right to choose, and we don't support government interference between her and her doctor. So I guess that's saying, no, that's the end of the quote after doctor. So I guess that that's saying that that's legal in all circumstances. And I think it's great that he did that. And this it's been a wonderful example. This is what was found in the Virginia governor's race that we were talking about, is that you can win with the public as it currently is by just pointing out the extremity of the position that most Democrats hold. They found that this was the best thing in past uh, in the past election for Virginia governor, and I'm glad to see Senator Paul working on this. Now, he has not yet gone to the point where he's talking about bringing about an end to abortion, which I think would be a wonderful winning campaign strategy. But if this is the second best, this is still much better than we have seen in the past and does appear to be someone who I believe will continue with the position through the regular election and not allow the polling numbers to slide, which will be what happens if we allow a candidate to slide from the position after the primary. This has been Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. I am sure that next week we will get Dr. Mike Hargadon back for the full show. This is Dr. Michael Crone signing out. Talk to you next week.